I missed uh, the wonderful lecture that uh, happened last uh, Monday. Um, so uh, we have uh, Dr. Zirun again uh, presenting the part two, uh, continuation of the discussion that was started on Monday. Um, please, as usual, continue to give comments, questions through the chat function only. And, um, uh, and everybody, please mute your phones. So that said, uh, we have also um, an exciting series of lectures organized for you starting next Monday for two weeks, which is going to focus on cardiology. Uh, I think um, we thought going from the lungs to the heart might be a reasonable thing so that we can uh, cover the cardiopulmonary system uh, in such a way that uh, would make sense. And so the topics, the presenters, you know, our you know, table of content will be sent to you um, probably tonight. Uh, and it's going to be a two-week series like we just did with the pulmonary piece here. It will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday for two weeks. And then we have some other series of lectures to follow after that. So without any further delay, I, the floor is uh, back to Dr. Zerion to continue from where he stopped. And uh, we'll just continue to collect your questions. And please mute your phone again. Thank you. Zerion, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Guma. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, I think last time we have looked uh, at ARDS and uh, the COVID pneumonia, the types and uh, some of the pathophysiology uh, mechanism. So I think uh, I just started, you know, uh, talking about the ventilators and uh, what uh, ventilator means, you know, basically it's a blower and uh, a timer. Um, and it's just, you know, a variation of that, you know, on top of that. So the timer is the valves which control uh, the breathing into the lung. So, you know, I presented that in a model of a balloon and a pinch, uh, fingers pinching the, the tube so that the pinching can decide how fast the air enters the balloon or the size of that air, the amount of air that goes into. So uh, every ventilator has uh, that system both on the inflation end and uh, on the exhalation end. So, you know, and how uh, the PIP is generated uh, as well. So it's, ventilator is in a concept. Ventilator is just, it's not one thing, but, you know, it, on top of the ventilator, we need, you know, air and oxygen supply. We need uh, a power supply. We need the breathing circuit and the uh, uh, interface, which is usually the endotracheal tube, or it could be tracheostomy. So uh, we need all of this to uh, make a ventilator a complete system. Just use so, <clears throat> You know, the first ventilators were uh, negative pressure ventilators, as you can see, iron lung, which is, you know, the patient doesn't have any endotracheal tube, as you can see from there. And uh, it's just the chest wall is being pulled out by the negative pressure created by uh, the device there. Uh, and then from there, we progress to the positive pressure ventilation. Uh, and, um, you know, in general, uh, when we think of the, uh, the mechanical lung ventilation, uh, there are three types. You know, the first one, the top, you could see there is intermittent positive ventilation. And the second one uh, is negative pressure ventilation, as you can see. So the, the pressure in the airway drops below the, the baseline, which is baseline or the zero is always the atmospheric pressure. So if it goes downward, it's a negative pressure. If it goes upward, you know, uh, it's a positive pressure. So that's how we differentiate, you know, on a ventilator, if we see the pressure tracing drawing below zero, that means the patient is trying to initiate the brace. Or if you see the pressure tracing, the, the tracing is being pulled down, right? that means the patient is trying, you know, to get more uh, brace on top of what the ventilator is giving. So uh, those are the types, you know, the high frequency types is, you know, usually in the pediatrics and so on. So, not what uh, for adults. 
Uh, so if you want to learn, you know, uh, ventilators generally, uh, you need some, you know, physics understanding. So, uh, you know, um, all of us have been through high school and you know, we learned about pressure, pressure gradient, you know, which means the pressure on one side uh, minus the other side. Uh, that's what determines, you know, uh, the flow and the gas volume, the gas flow resistance resistance means you know the um, any tube any kind of tube has a resistance so or our airway has a resistance for air entering uh, or any kind of uh, air or fluid going through it so uh, compliance is um, the easiness to inflate the balloon so a balloon could be compliant you know if a, if you take a thin balloon and you know you use the same pressure and try to inflate it it gets so large because it is very compliant whereas if you take a, a thick balloon and try to inflate it, it you can get that large with the same kind of pressure so that that thick balloon is non-compliant so it's the same concept so when you get it to to the lung uh, if the lung doesn't have you know you know it's not wet or normal then it's usually uh the compliance is good, so you can easily uh, inflate the lung. But if the lung is wet, you know, like in case of ARDS or pneumonia or anything, then it gets non-compliant. And uh, you can see uh, uh, this on a ventilator. And the calculation for it is, you know, tidal volume over uh, the driving pressure. So, and the uh, uh, last one, respiratory time constant is uh, another concept. So I think it's for another time. So, you know, you need to have these ideas. Um, so when you see on a ventilator, these are the uh, parameters you'll find uh, for controlling. You know, uh, if you want to control the ventilation, ventilation, uh, when we say we're mainly talking about, you know, problems of, you know, uh, high CO2. So, you know, uh, the things you can do are you can, you know, tidal volume, you can increase it if the CO2 is very high, or if the CO2 is pushed below normal, then if you want to increase it, then you can decrease the tidal volume. Uh, the other thing you can do, if it is a pressure mode, then you can increase the pressure up or down to control the ventilation. The same thing on pressure support. Uh, and you know the other thing you can do is you know the mandatory rate. Uh, if you have a problem of you know high you know CO2, then you can increase the rate so that more CO2 would be uh, blown out of the, the body. Uh, the other thing we use is the inspiratory uh, time or the IE ratio. So the more we give E time, that means expiratory time, the more the patient ventilates. So uh, when you have a problem, you can modify, you can modify all of these things on the ventilator. Uh, so that's for, you know, high CO2. Uh, for oxygenation, you have two tools. Uh, the first one is FiO2, you know, you can increase the FiO2. Uh, that means the ventilator, uh, you know, it decides the FiO2 by mixing the air and uh, the pure oxygen. So it increases the pure oxygen uh, component. And the other one is a PEEP. So what PEEP does is it increases the interface. Uh, it opens up uh, the alveoli, you know, it stretches them out. Uh, so that there will be more interface for the blood in the air so that a lot of exchange takes place. So if you have a problem for oxygenation, those are the two tools uh, you use. Uh, if you have a problem with the patient being desynchronous, you know, fighting the ventilator. So uh, the, the tools you can use are, you know, one, you can use if the problem is triggered, like the patient is trying to trigger, but the patient is not, you know, understanding the trigger and not giving, then you can uh, increase the sensitivity of this trigger up down. You know, sometimes you don't want much trigger because this will cause auto triggering, you know. Uh, so you have to sit in a, in a very uh, right uh, uh, trigger. Um, so there are pressure triggers, there are flow triggers uh, settings. So uh, you can decide which one uh, you want to do. Uh, and then, you know, um, uh, adjust for the patient. So every patient is not the same, so they need a different trigger. Other thing, other uh, uh, control is the rise time. Sometimes patient wants uh, the flow really to go fast, you know, and then the ventilator is not giving fast. So then sometimes it's that the slope that you have to adjust. So you have uh, that setting too. So um, 
you know, uh, so that's another thing. If the patient is desynchronous, you could see uh, on, a, on a pressure tracing, while the pressure is going up, if you see a bow down pressure tracing, that means the patient is trying to suck in more air and dropping the pressure because he's applying the, uh, you know, the negative pressure on top of the, the positive pressure the ventilator is giving. So that means he wanted a faster breather, but the ventilator is not giving this. So uh, then you can, you can increase the rise time and you know, that can satisfy the patient. Other thing is the flow cycle. So if the cycle is short or terminated early on, the patients won't be happy. You see them fighting the pain. So I think you know you can adjust the the cycle. You know you can make uh, the flow cycle up and down uh, so that the patient will be satisfied. So these are the controls you have. You know, uh, you know most ventilators and you know depending on the mode. So uh, for ventilation, for oxygenation, and for you know desynchrony issues. So indications of mechanical ventilations, I think, you know, you guys all know if there is an oxygen, oxygenation failure, like in ARDS, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, you know, ARDS means non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and, you know, the other component is cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, COVID-19, P, all this, uh, you know, for all these things, you know, oxygenation failure from those causes, you know, uh, we, we put patients on ventilator. Other is hypercapnic respiratory failure, somebody who has COPD or asthma uh, or neuromusculatory uh, failure, like, you know, spinal cord injury or polio or Guillain barre So these kinds of, for example, COPD uh, patients, they may need more E time because their uh, problem is CO2, you want to give them more E time. So when you adjust uh, the ventilator, you have to look things like that. For example, in asthma, the, the biggest issue is, you know, they trap a lot of air in their lung. And if you don't put appropriate setting, you know, uh, they may, you know, you may cause pneumothorax because too much air will be trapped. Uh, you may cause shock and so on because of, you know, all the uh, high intrathoracic pressure. So typically if you see an asthma patients, we set a rate like, around 10 and we give, you know, IE ratio of one to six, one to five, you know, we give them a lot of exhalation time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, those things are important. The other is respiratory muscle hepatic. If, uh, if a patient uh, um, has fatigue from, say, from sepsis, pneumonia, they have been freezing and so on, looks tired, then that's, you know, another reason. And the other is, you know, airway uh, protection, like for comatose patients who are unable to, you know, uh, someone unable to control secretion or overdosing or some. So these are the basic indications. Uh, and, you know, I said this, you know, last time, ventilator management for, you know, many patients usually we see post-op, you know, airway protection, so on, it's easy. But when it comes to critically ill patient, it needs really, uh, uh, a critical eye and uh, uh, good monitoring uh, ways. So the goals of mechanical ventilation, again, is uh, to give, uh, you know, adequate gas exchange, but without injuring, uh, you know, the lung. So, you know, you have to always keep those two uh, things, you know, uh, you don't need normal or normal gas, but you need just adequate and, uh, and, uh, but the main goal is to protect uh, more injured from the mechanical ventilation. So in the past, it used to be normalizing arterial blood gas. So they were using a so huge high, you know, tidal volume and so on. Uh, but we later found at, uh, with studies, you know, randomized controlled trials that this is bad. So, you know, now the, the goal is, uh, you know, small tidal volume minimize ventilator lung in, you know, uh, ventilator and just lung injury, um, and so on. So, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's said again, you know, mechanical ventilation is a, a necessary evil because the lung is tired, but in, we would like to, uh, you know, the best way is, you know, if you have a way of, you know, gas exchange some other way, the best thing is to let this lung rest and heal, uh, but you know, unfortunately, we don't have you know too much weight, so we have to again uh, have the lung work even harder by using a ventilator. So it's a necessary evil, you know, to avoid you know hypoxemia-related deaths. 
but you know, uh, again, you know, when, because the ventilator really tries to work hard, a lung which is already tired, you know, it's going to cause more injury. You can't avoid all the injuries from the ventilator, but you should try to minimize uh, it as low as possible. Uh, again, uh, you know, uh, what uh, usually what has been seen in the past is, you know, you, you know, you, if, you do, if you use like overzealous tidal volume and pressure, the patient, you know, may survive your ICU, but he will die later because they will develop, you know, a multi-organ failure from uh, all the injuries you caused uh, in the lung and then, you know, the cytokine storm causing, you know, other organs to fail. That's how these patients die. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, the, uh, to understand uh, mechanical ventilators, so you have to know the basic vent, you know, ventilator or breast types and the ventilator more. So I'm going to be talking about those. So uh, I'll start with the breast type, mechanical breast types. So, you know, breast types, you know, mechanical breast types are defined by what triggers the breast, what stops the breast or cycles the breast, and what is the target or the control. You know, uh, the triggering could be uh, the ventilator or the patient. So the ventilator can uh, give a breath, you know, if the patient has a breath, uh, depending on the time you set or the rate you set, you know, the ventilator would uh, give. Or the patient, you know, if the ventilator sees uh, the pressure dripping down and uh, has, you know, the patient created enough negative uh, or lower pressure. Uh, the ventilator uh, will give. So the trigger could be patient uh, or the uh, ventilator. The cycling uh, could be, you know, it could be time cycled or depend just, you know, you know with the time you say, and the, the ventilator knows to stop there, or it could be a, a pressure cycling, uh, or that means when the pressure reaches a certain level, the ventilator stops the flow. Uh, or flow or in, you know, the flow uh, cycle. So again, you know, uh, every ventilator has a pressure sensor and a flow sensors in the circuits. So that's how, you know, it determines. So, you know, those are parts of the ventilator, you know, sensors. Uh, and um, that's why uh, you are able to read uh, the pressure in the ventilator on the monitor. The volume is decided by the flow. So if you have a certain flow over a certain time, and that's it, you know, you get flow times by uh, time will give you the tidal volume. So uh, the volume uh, is uh, decided by uh, the flow. So the two sensors you have on a ventilator are pressure sensors and uh, flow sensors. So that's how you cycle either with time, with pressure or with flow. Trigger patient versus, uh, you know, ventilator. And the controlling, you know, the target is, you know, you can target a volume like certain tidal volume, or you can target a certain pressure. So uh, your target could be uh, pressure or uh, volume. So that's what defines uh, the breast type. So I'm going to show you uh, a few examples. So again, you know, uh, here the trigger, uh, what initiates the breast, you know, is time pressure or uh, flow triggers. And as you can see uh, on the, on the, the square here, uh, if uh, the pressure, you know, drops below certain level, so you put that sensitivity there, the threshold, once that, you know, threshold is passed, the ventilator knows to give a breath. So that is a patient uh, triggered breath. For example, on this one, you know, you could see that this is uh, a machine initiated breath. And here, the, uh, there is a dip down, so uh, the patient, the ventilator understands and uh, gives uh, um, the breath, and this is actually a flow uh, breath. So you don't want the uh, ventilator uh, to be uh, a very high trigger sensitivity or low trigger sensitivity. High trigger, if it is high trigger, there is a risk of auto triggering. So you'll see this ventilator giving. So for example, this happens in, especially in flow, if you set a flow trigger, and uh, sometimes the ventilator reaches the cardiac oscillation as a flow and, you know, it can give and, you know, you may need to uh, decrease the sensitivity. Um, or, you know, if there is any, you know, um, humidity in the circuit, that can also happen from that. Uh, 
Um, and you know, you don't want also low trigger sensitivity because the patients want a present and the ventilator not giving. So you don't want the patient to be uh, desynchronous. Uh, you know, here I sent an example of, you know, uh, auto triggering. Uh, you could see that the initial braces were set, you know, to run like that. Then suddenly, you know, the ventilator, you uh, hear it, you know, so uh, that is auto triggering. Um, and this can happen, you know, if there is any gas leak or any circuit, uh, um, you know, humidity or any cardiac insulation, you know, can cause uh, this kind of auto triggering. Cycling, what stops the, uh, the, the, the brace? You know, it could be time cycle or flow cycle. So uh, as you can see here uh, on the top, you know, the IE time is one to two. Uh, so that ratio is reached, the ventilator knows to stop. Uh, so for example, if you have a rate of 20, uh, you know, that means 20 braces uh, per minute. And so for each brace, that means there is about uh, three seconds. And, uh, and out of those three seconds, one second is for inspiration and two seconds is for expiration. So as you, as you decrease, uh, you know, the, the rate you, you are uh, typically would be giving more uh, E time. Uh, but again, uh, this can be uh, arranged depending on um, how uh, you sit in the ventilator uh, parameters. So uh, here you see the flow cycles. Uh, uh, and you, you see the, the ventilator flow goes and when it reaches certain flow, it will be cut and you know it will go straight down. So that's how you know that it's a flow uh, cycle, you know, by looking at the uh, flow time uh, tracings. So uh, these are the five basic uh, brace types. So if you look carefully, I mean, you know, the, the first one here is uh, the volume control uh, brace type. So uh, here, you know, in a typical ventilator screen, you would see uh, uh, airway pressure tracing. So this line is uh, pressure over time. And the next line is flow over time. And the next line is volume over time. So in a volume controlled brace, this is uh, when, when the, re the reason they are named volume controlled braces, you know, because the target is volume and uh, you said it's controlled because it is a ventilator which is uh, giving. These are mandatory braces which the ventilator gives. So uh, in this volume uh, control uh, brace, if you see the airway uh, pressure, it is variable. Those dot lines, you know, any of those could be, uh, you could see them, you know, uh, from one to the other depending on the lung compliance and uh, resistance. So uh, that is uh, the pressure, the pressure is variable in a volume controlled brace. And in a volume controlled brace, the flow is constant here. So you can see because uh, the ventilator knows to give a set volume uh, by, you know, uh, you know, flow over a certain time. So in a volume controlled brace, what you see is the flow is constant. Actually, you said this on a ventilator, you know, 65, uh, you know, liter per minute, you know, or 100 liter per minute, 85. So you say that depending on your patient. So uh, uh, then, uh, you know, you see that a constant flow on a volume control bit. And the, tar the target is volume. So on the lower uh, um, one, you can see that the volume uh, is, uh, you know, certain. So. Uh, on, on this modes, you could see uh, the important things are the pressure is variable, the flow is constant, and there is a set volume. So if the patient is placed on volume control mode, uh, which means you know only the patient will get only a, a breath uh, only coming from the ventilator, but the patient if the patient tries to initiate her zone, he doesn't get it. That means you know you see this and soft braces and the same tidal volume uh, going on for a while. The other, you know, the second one is volume assist brace. On this one, uh, the, the difference between uh, volume control and volume assist is, you know, assist 
is uh, to mean that the patient is initiating the breast, but the rest of the work is done by the ventilator. So uh, here again, you know, uh, the, the pressure is variable uh, because it's a volume mode and the flow is constant. Once the patient initiates the breast, the ventilator takes over and gives him that constant flow. It doesn't allow the patient to change the flow. So sometimes this makes the patients unhappy because they may want a higher flow or so. So you may need to adjust the flow up uh, or you know you could give them a different mode where they decide the flow. The patient decide the flow. So in the same, you know, the same target for you. So, uh, you know, um, so there are modes where we call them the most common mode actually is assist control volume. That means, uh, you know, there is assisted braces, there is controlled braces, but the target is volume. So you see a combination of these two braces, uh, and we call them the, you call that mode assist control volume. That means you see uh, some of the uh, braces initiated by the, the patient, some of uh, them initiated by the uh, machine. So um, that is a volume mode. The next one is pressure control mode. So on this one, if we see uh, on the uh, pressure tracing, the pressure comes and then it stays constant. So that's how you know you differentiate between uh, you know, uh, volume mode and pressure mode because on pressure modes, the, the pressure is constant. You know, here is, if you could see it's variable and you know, it's kind of up and down, but here up and stays constant then come down. So that's a pressure control uh, brace. So, but on the pressure control brace, unlike the volume modes, the, the flow is variable. So you can see those dotted lines, it's variable because the patient decides the flow. You know, you just, you know, give uh, the, uh, the pressure target and the patient decides how fast uh, the brace uh, go uh, in. And the volume also is variable. Here, as you can see, the volume can vary from brace to brace. So, you know, uh, a patient can be placed on a pressure control mode, uh, but that means uh, in that kind of mode, the patient cannot initiate the brace and the uh, the, the flow uh, will be, the flow and the volume will be decided by based on the lung compliance and resistance. So um, uh, typically we don't use just a control mode only because, you know, that will cause the patient to be unhappy unless the patient is paralyzed and so on. So, uh, you know, we use typically, you know, control assist mode. So the same concept here on a pressure assist mode, there is a set pressure. As you can see, the pressure goes up and stays constant, but you see that dip here, uh, and that is a sign that the patient initiated the breath and the ventilator takes over and give a constant pressure. And uh, in here, the flow is variable, as you can see, different uh, flows. So uh, this depends on the patient, you know, compliance, the lung compliance, resistance, and also the patient effort. Um, so, and the target volume is variable. So. It, in this mode, it's a pressure mode, and uh, what's constant is pressure. The difference between these two is here the patient initiated, here the machine initiated. So the other typical mode we use uh, in ICU is you know assist control pressure. So that means you see a co you know a combination of this and this braces. So some of the braces you see on a ventilator is you know control, or you see control control, then the patient initiates. You know, or the next one again, the patient initiates and patient initiates, then you know control. So if you see that kind of breath, then you know that's how you identify this is assist control pressure, uh, the same way assist control volume. Uh, and the pressure support uh, mode is one of the winning mode. You know, uh, so uh, here again uh, the um, the patient initiates the breath on the pressure support mode. So uh, the ventilator here does not initiate uh, any brace. So all the braces should be initiated by the, the ventilator and the ventilator gives that set pressure, uh, you know, support. So uh, unless if the patient doesn't initiate the brace, then the ventilator doesn't give unless you put some uh, backup mode or apnea mode so that, you know, the patient is happening for, for example, for 20 seconds or 30 seconds, and you have a backup mode that will be activated. Otherwise, the patient won't give any brace on uh, this pressure support mode. 
So again, uh, the, there is a minimal flow, but you know, the flow is variable depending on the patient effort. Uh, and uh, uh, patient, uh, the, you know, the volume again is uh, variable. So the difference be between pressure support and this other pressure control, pressure assist is there is no set rate. In these ones, you know, uh, on the pressure control or assist control mode, there is a set rate. That means the ventilator guarantees you a certain rate of uh, presses uh, and the rest the patient can do over than that. But in this one, there is no set rate. The patient has to initiate uh, this process, and that means the patient has to be awake and strong enough at least to initiate the press. Um, so these are the, ba the five basic ventilator types. Um, and you know, depending on that, you know, so uh, again, this is the same concept, so I'm gonna pass it. So go to the ventilator mode. So as you can see, this is a uh, pressure uh, control mode. So you know, we said here the rate is 15. Uh, the pressure control, uh, the target pressure you said is 18 centimeters of water. So that means the ventilator will go and, uh, you know, stays at 18 centimeter uh, pressure. Uh, and uh, you said the PIP of five, you know, if I out of 60%, and this is the flow trigger. So you said that uh, the flow trigger, when it is uh, below uh, two liter per minute, the ventilator uh, uh, would, uh, uh, would initiate the press. The IE ratio is one to two, so two, uh, you know, it's a proportion. So whatever the, uh, the press time you give for each press, you know, uh, the two third of the time will be given to exhalation and one third of the time will be given to inhalation. So this is in, an important parameter. Like, you know, if you, uh, if you have a problem with oxygenation in ER days, the first thing usually you try is FiO2 give them more oxygen. The next is if you have a problem, then you give them pressure. The, and after you know you exhausted pressure, then the next thing you go is the time. So that means you you can increase that I time, inspiratory time, uh, uh, so that the pressure will be sustained during that time. And uh, you call that sometimes uh, inverse ratio. That means typically, you know, we you know when whenever a normal person breathes or when we put someone on a ventilator, we give more time for exhalation because exhalation is passive and it takes, but in, you know, inspiration is active and it can be given fast depending on the flow. Um, uh, so if you have a problem with oxygenation, you can increase that eye time. Uh, so that's one of the ways we manage uh, oxygenation uh, failure and, you know, in modes like APRV uh, or, you know, inverse ratio uh, more so. Uh, this is the uh, P ramp is the, uh, that the flow, uh, how fast, you know, it goes there. So you can increase and satisfy this, the patient, if the patients want more flow. So uh, mode is basically, you know, as a uh, ventilator uh, setting and uh, it's the, what the sequence of braids you see. So you look at them and if you see the patient initiating and the ventilator initiating, and you look at the target, then you say this is assist control volume or assist control uh, pressure. Or if the patient is not you know, initiating, is this you know, a volume control mode or a pressure control mode? If, if all the braces are initiated and uh, there is no uh, ventilator initiating, then it is probably a pressure support mode. So uh, these are again, you know, so Dr. Zerud, I have uh, you know, a couple of questions are coming through about uh, triggering. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, you know, if you can go back, please, onto the graph and show exactly when, how do you know this is really patient triggered is number one. And also, you know, how do you know if it is a machine that's, so basically, if you can just I point to them, um, how you know that this is a patient triggered versus it is not a patient triggered, so on the, on the graph. Okay, so you know you see on like uh, here on the airway uh, pressure uh, uh, monitoring, if you see those, you know this is like the baseline line. That's atmospheric pressure, right? You know when we say the name, we give the name positive pressure because all the pressures are above the atmospheric line, right? So uh, and if you see any dip like that below the atmospheric you know, uh, pressure, that is a patient's 
is what is doing. That means the diaphragm is contracting and sucking and creating a negative pressure, dropping the pressure below the atmospheric pressure. So that is a sign, you know, and any airway pressure sign, if you see any, uh, any, anything below that line, that means that's a patient effort. You, you know, above that line is, you know, that's what you call positive pressure ventilation. So uh, that's how you know. And if there is nothing dropping between or below that, that's probably, uh, you know, a Martian triggered uh, uh, breath. Does that answer? Um, yes, and, and how about when you are really set with volume? Is it also the same or do you really look at the pressure tracing? I think the say, best way is uh, to look at the, the pressure. You can, uh, you know, the, sometimes the flow also uh, can't tell you, but the best way is, you know, get out the, the pressure tracing on, a, on the ventilator screen. And that's how you tell this is, you know, a patient. And the other thing is the ventilator itself tells you. If you see on the top, sometimes they write A, C, you know, this thing would, uh, uh, would change, you know, and A means, you know, assist, C means control. So some of the ventilator will write, you know, uh, it says, if it says C, 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 you know, with each breath, it tells you what kind of breath. C means control, that means machine triggered. And A means assist, which means, you know, a patient initiated uh, breath. So sometimes the ventilator itself uh, would tell you. Uh, sometimes you may need to enlarge these uh, tracings, so uh, you know, and then you can easily tell. But this is not any difficult. You can easily. Mm, it's very clear. It. Thank you. And also the time. I mean, I think there is a rate you set on the ventilator. If a, a vent, you know, breast comes before that time comes, you know, it's either uh, you know patient triggered, or you know, it is auto-triggered race. So, you know, that, you know, to, to differentiate between the two, we have to look into things. But, you know, uh, so if you set a rate of 12 and, you know, you are seeing a rate, you know, about 15 or 16, that means there is more braces, you know, which either, you know, most likely the patient initiated or it could be auto-triggered. Okay, is that clear? Any other question? No, that was good. I think we can keep going. Okay. So uh, again, uh, the ventilator modes, I think we saw those. Mm, you know, there are traditional advanced and, you know, uh, biphasic modes. So I think we we'll focus on, you know, maybe the traditional mode, which are like assist control, pressure support. And there is an older mode called SIMV. SIMV, the kind of braces you see, are, you know, there are volume control braces and pressure support braces. So if you see a combination of volume, co you know, control braces and uh, um, pressure support braces, that's SIMV. Uh, but it's an older mode, I think. We don't use it these days a whole lot. So you either use assist control and if the patient starts to win, then you use uh, pressure support modes. There are, you know, uh, advanced modes, you know, uh, which, for example, you know, one of them is, you know, assisted supported ventilation, proportional assist, uh, ASV, PAV, NAVA. These are really smart modes, you know. Uh, basically, the ventilator, you know, uh, learns about the lung compliance. You know, it sees how the lung is stiff, how the airway resistance uh, is, how the patient active is. So it can, it can, uh, decide, you know, uh, you know, if the patient is so active, the patient would, the ventilator would back off and let, let the patient, you know, uh, do the breathing. If the patient stops breathing, it will uh, initiate and do all the works, protecting the lung. And, you know, there are, you know, there are some, you know, crazy modes, you know, they can do all the work from initiation to weaning to, and then it finally will uh, alarm for you, you know, ready, ready for extubation. So, uh, there are those smart modes uh, nowadays, and uh, this NAVA is, you know, neurologically uh, uh, assisted ventilation. This is basically you have uh, an electrode in your diaphragm, so the ventilator is so sensitive that the, the minute the, vent the diaphragm starts to contract, the ventilator knows electricity, then knows how to breathe. So this is to increase the patient ventilator synchrony. So nowadays the technology is more on you know, adapting the ventilator to the to the patient. So there's, there are you know, smart modes uh, 
uh, which uh, kind of synchronize the, uh, decreases the desynchrony. Uh, but, you know, I think for you guys, I would say focusing on the traditional mode uh, would be good. I'm not sure if, you, if there are ventilators that uh, are uh, with advanced mode, but in a, in a poor setting, I think this will be ideal because I think you, can, you may not find the physician or uh, the staff to do all the work 24 seven, you know, and you know, in US setting, we have respiratory therapists, you know, looking at it and, you know, and so on adjusting, but these modes, uh, if you have them like in a poor setting, then, you know, it can uh, adjust all the things you need, most of the things. So uh, again, volume control versus pressure control versus, you know, adaptive control or smart modes, you know, uh, you could see uh, the, if you see on the pressure, uh, on the volume control mode, it goes up. There is nothing, you know, constant about the pressure here, you know, constant uh, pressure. And, you know, the smart modes are usually uh, pressure uh, control modes in a way. You know, if you, if you think of the volume control mode, is, is like a dictator, like it decides, you know, this is what you get, the volume and, you know, this is the flow you get. So it's like a dictator mode. So that's why patients, you know, may not be happy on the volume control mode. Whereas in the uh, pressure modes, it's more of a liberal mode. So the patient decides the volume, the patient decides the flow. So patient seems to be more happy. The problem with that is your volume is, you know, variable. So that means if the patient lung compliance, for example, lowers, you know, while you are sleeping at home, then the tidal volume gets smaller and smaller and the patient gets hypercapnic and acidosis. So it doesn't guarantee you the volume uh, you need. So you can put alarms and so on, but, you know, that's not, you know, guaranteed. So that's a problem. Uh, and on the other hand, most of the ARDS trials are done on the volume control mode. So uh, but, you know, if, you know, someone is watching available for you, I think pressure control mode makes the patient more happier. Again, uh, this is uh, um, um, just to say, assist control has, you know, patient uh, uh, triggered in, you know, a ventilator triggered uh, braces. So, you know, again, this is to show you how that trigger thing uh, is. So this is like control brace. This is assisted brace because the patient initiated or dipped the, the pressure below uh, that. Uh, and, you know, the volume though is the same between, if you see the control brace volume and the assisted brace volume, they are the same because the, the target is volume. The patient, the ventilator won't give more volume than even if the patient wants because that's what you say, uh, and the flow is constant. So this is uh, assist control volume mode. Uh, again, you know, two types of assist control, volume mode, pressure mode, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, different characteristics of them. Uh, again, this is what decides the trigger, the limit, and uh, the cycle. And I try to put uh, the difference between the different uh, Braces here. Um, so, how do you decide, you know, which mode to use? You know, you have to see these things. One, the patient breathing status. Uh, that means is the patient active or partially active or passive. Uh, so, um, if the, you know, if the patient is passive, it, you know, really doesn't matter. But if the patient is active, for example, you know, you know, you may prefer pressure modes because the patient wants to decide the volume he wants and the flow he wants. Uh, um, and if the patient is partially, you know, active, for example, assist control mode uh, would be a uh, preferred mode. So these days we don't want to oversedate patients. We want them to be somehow, uh, you know, arousable and so on. So assist control mode is, that's why it's a famous mode, you know, uh, partially awake patients. Uh, and um, the other thing you, you need to look when you decide to what kind of mode uh, to, to use is uh, volume, uh, pressure, or adaptive uh, is depending on uh, your staff familiar, familiarity. So, uh, you know, your staff should know, um, know well because you, are, you can't be always there and, you know, some of it they should manage. So I think that's another thing. 
uh, and you know, depending on what you want to achieve, you know, either uh, a secure minute ventilation or uh, you know, vent synchrony or uh, whatever. So you you decide based on uh, these three uh, factors. So again, the patient types. Um, the same thing. What kind of patients you have? Staff familiarity. Again, these are the controls. Uh, these are the different. Uh, Type so I will pass. So I think you know, I'm sorry, I think time is probably running. You know, I have a lot of slides to go through, uh, but you know, I think you guys have gotten the slides. I think you know, I, I may leave some minutes for question, or do you want me to go over a little bit, Dr. Luma? I don't, I don't see a lot of questions unless uh, um, many questions you know come up. Uh, maybe if you can keep, um, uh, maybe cover two more slides and then I have a question and if there's some additional question from the audience, we'll, we'll get to you. So are there things you want to add in, in a couple of slides more or, or um, are you going you to stop yeah, here? I wanted to show you that, for example, you know, the difference, uh, what you see on the smart mode. So on the smart mode here, as you can see, the patient initiated the brace and uh, the pressure line here is constant, but this could vary. On the next one, uh, the brace maybe uh, the pressure target could be lower than uh, what you know the prior brace shows. And this goes up, so that line goes up and down. So this depends. The ventilator sees what the patient is doing, and it can increase the support. It can decrease the support depending on the patient need and the target, and so on. So. Uh, that's how you uh, you know this this smart mode, but you know uh, again uh, depending on the availability in the Ethiopian setting. So uh, here uh, on a mode, for example, you know volume control mode, all the braces are initiated by uh, the ventilator. There is nothing going below that uh, baseline tip. Uh, but here, you know, you could see that dipping and again dipping. So this is uh, assist control mode. And this is on uh, pressure uh, control. Again, uh, the pressure reach there and all the uh, breathings are initiated by the ventilator. Whereas here, some of them initiated by the, uh, the ventilator and the patient. So in, on this adaptive or smart mode, so uh, this pressure can go up, down, you know, uh, depending on uh, the, the, the patient. But this is, in this patient, the patient is completely passive or resting, so the ventilator takes over. And when the patient starts to be active, you know, the, the ventilator learns and, you know, will give him the breath, you know, depend, you will see how much effort the patient does. And depending on that, it can decrease the pressure support, it can increase the pressure target. So, uh, you know, this is uh, how you, why you call the um, um, adaptive or smart modes. Um, again, these are the different smart modes. Uh, so, and how you select, you know, one mode over the other, depending on, uh, you know, the patient activity status uh, uh, here, what uh, can guide you there. So, uh, again, mode is a part of ventilator setting. Uh, and it's just to say that the special set of presents consequences. Uh, so you have to see the patient uh, status and you have to know what controls you have and how uh, you need to modify them. Uh, there are also alternative modes, you know, what we use them, for example, you know, if you use assist control, you know, uh, pressure or assist control volume and you are unable to still get uh, adequate gas exchange, there are modes you can use things like by level or airway pressure release mode. These are when you, you know, face with a severe ARDS patients. You know, the other one is, you know, high frequency uh, ventilation. So uh, depending on several things, you know, if you have refractory hypoxemia, refractory high, you know, respiratory acidosis, you may try different uh, uh, excessive airway pressure, uh, you know, patient ventilator synchrony are competing other privately. For example, the patient may have uh, brain uh, swelling, and you know you need uh, you know uh, a mode which guarantees the CO2 and you know limits the pressure. So 
you know, you have to see the patient in general and, you know, uh, may decide to use. So this is one of the, you know, the airway uh, pressure release ventilation. I had a patient that was a day on this mode and I used it because uh, the patient was too hypoxic and getting too much pressure uh, uh, and, um, um, and dyssynchronous. So I use this mode because, you know, the patient can uh, breathe on top of uh, what, uh, you know, you are setting. So for, you know, this is the APRV mode, as you can see, there is a set pressure and it's a long time, you know, we are giving more time on the eye time. And there is a, basically a very short release time. You know, this is, you know, when I say to my patient, I have five seconds for each breath and four seconds on the inspiratory and one second on the expiratory. So uh, this is just so that the patient ventilate, you know, or the CO2 could be removed uh, in that short time. Uh, but on that I time, the patient, here is the ventilator uh, pressure uh, line, but the patient is breathing on top of that. So, you know, you are giving a pressure and you are allowed to the I increase down the sedation so that the patient can initiate and actually work it for me. So, but these kinds of mode you can use uh, when uh, you are doing. Um, so, so it looks like uh, we have you know a few more questions. But if you could just go back one slide, I think where you are, um, there is a there is a question. You know, just to elaborate a little bit the difference between BiPAP and the a a APRV mode. You know, how are they different? Uh, so. BiPAP is, um, um, the, the, you know, there are similarities and differences. So BiPAP is the same thing. So you have a high pressure and you have uh, a low pressure. Uh, so the, the, on BiPAP mode, the patient initiates uh, the breath and the pressure uh, will go to the target you, you go. And then you have uh, a time. So one thing, the inspiratory time on BiPAP is not, um, even though you are not setting it, uh, but the patient is awake and breathing, uh, it's usually the eye time uh, would be shorter than the E time. Uh, the other thing is, you know, on this APRV mode, uh, there is no leak, on, whereas on the BiPAP mode, there is leak. So the, the ventilator needs to compensate for that, you know, leak. Uh, on APRV mode because it's a closed circuit mode, um, you know, there is no uh, leak. So uh, you can't use, you know, the typical ventilator for a BiPAP. Uh, the reason is that, you know, you have to be able to compensate for the leak if you want to, uh, uh, to use uh, as a BiPAP. But, you know, in, in many ways they are, they are, they are similar. Uh, they are similar. Um, I think the, the leak compensation is the main difference. The other thing is uh, uh, um, the time, the eye time is the, the difference. Okay, great. So, so you know, there is a, uh, a couple of questions about, you know, deciding the mode. And, um, you know, two of them at least go around, you know, the wide use of uh, SIMV in Ethiopia as the more that they start, you know, uh, ventilation and uh, particularly in pediatrics. So the questions are twofold. One is, you know, um, if there are differences in your setting when you are dealing with uh, peds versus adults, is this usually the disease condition that um, makes you choose what mode you're gonna use? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Because it looks like I think the SIMV, which you just mentioned earlier, as an older version, is probably what is being used in our traditional setting. Um, I think SIMV is a good mode because um, you can use it in all kinds of patients. You know, you know the name itself is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. So there is a mandatory portion. Right, so uh, so for example, you know you could you could say that mandatory rate of six, so it guarantees you that six breathes at target volume, uh, and uh, 
the rest would be, uh, you know, pressure supported. So, uh, you know, if the patient initiates breathe more than six times, that means the ventilator wouldn't give the target volume, but it just gives certain pressure. The patient decides the volume, you know, you'd like to get. So, I mean, this mode is good because, you know, you look at them today, uh, they look like they need more support than what you do is, you know, you increase the rate and, you know, um, you know, let them be. Um, and then the next day you come, you know, if they uh, look better, then what you do is you decrease the rate, you know, from six to four. And, you know, then two, that means you are allowing more of the, 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 the breathing to be, you know, just more like SBT type. So, um, you know, you, you know, but these days, the reason we use, um, you know, not using that is, you know, typically if the patient needs support, that means you have to decide that they need support, they need to rest. You let them be on a mode where they will be resting. And when they are ready, you put them uh, to uh, a winning mode and, you know, you, uh, you start winning. So what happened with SIMB mode is, you know, it, it's taking longer and longer days uh, on a ventilator for a patient. So one of our aim is to remove this ventilator ASAP because ventilator comes with a lot of costs. And each day, you know, uh, the vent a patient says on a ventilator is more risk of ventilator induced lung injury, ventilator associated pneumonia, and so on. So it, it gets on. So uh, with SIMV mode, uh, that's what happens. And that's why, you know, in the modern days, we are backing off from that. But, you know, I think you can use it both in adult and in, in pediatrics. I don't practice pediatrics. Uh, but you can use, I mean, as long as you are comfortable use it, there is no problem for it. The only drawback, as I say, it is, you know, uh, you, it may lead to an excessive number of days on the ventilator. Okay. And then, um, um, you know, there are, I'm sure, a lot of lingering questions and for which um, when we go back um, on Friday, I would encourage everybody to come maybe prepared after looking at the slides and also uh, maybe listening to some of the past lectures to have um, you know, some pointed questions because we are going to have a lot more time for questions and answers on Friday. Um, and Friday will be uh, the conclusion, at least in this short series of um, lectures uh, on intensive therapy and uh, respiratory therapy. And so please come prepared to ask uh, more questions from previous lectures and uh, please um, uh, go back and review the slides um, and, uh, uh, and hopefully we can have a more engaged discussion rather than lecturing you again on Friday. Um, just one uh, last question, Zarihon, and you can also maybe provide some uh, answers for this on Friday. Uh, you know, when do you know, when do we decide patients should have a surgical airway? Because, you know, a lot of times patients on ventilators who have been on uh, for some time are, you know, decided to, you know, to get a tracheostomy beat, percutaneous or open tracheostomy. So I think uh, knowing from your side about some of the um, decision-making process so that people can be aware of that. And, you know, sometimes you decide by days in some places they say, oh, it's 10 days. So, I mean, it's very subjective at times. And, and so if there is some guidelines, I think it would be probably a nice thing to discuss uh, as part of the panel on Friday. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, one last question is, you know, this adoptive um, system that you mentioned, in, um, you know, uh, which is basically one of the smartest way of doing this, I think. Um, does it need more sedation or or less sedation? And I would assume it should be less sedation because it must be yeah. more friendlier. So uh, what are your thoughts there? So in general, in ICU, I think the, the lesser sedation, the better. So that's the rule, you know. Um, you know, I think these days we even say that the lesser you do on the patient, the better, because I mean, the more intervention, the more problem. So, uh, especially sedation is really uh, 
proven again and again that it does not do good for the patient. So, uh, you know, I said whenever you sedate a patient, if you want to sedate, first of all, you have to be convinced that they need a sedation. Some patients do well without sedation. If they don't need, you know, they are comfortable if you can talk to them, and that would be best. It just or gives them PRN and pushes here and there, you know, uh, so you know, rather than drips. Uh, if you use drips, you have to use target. That means, you know, you have to give the nurses, you know, I want the patient, uh, you know, so that when I call his name, I want him to be able to open eyes and, you know, uh, maybe close immediately or 10 seconds. You know, there are goals we use in the ICU. We call them RAS, um, you know, um, rapid uh, agitation and condition scale. Uh, you can copy and use that. So you have to give the nurses that, that target and they need to use that. So in general is to avoid, uh, you know, sedation, heavy sedation, unless, for example, if, if the patient is too hypoxic and you want them really to rest, then you use deep sedation. Like if the peer pressure is so bad and the patient is dyssynchronous and, you know, uh, then in that case, you may need to use deep sedation. So it depends on the patients, uh, but you know, the lesser, the better. And um, uh, so I think that's, I, I can say about the sedation. Uh, with the adaptive mode, what was the question? Sorry, Dr. Gilman. No, yeah, if you need more sedation than less sedation, but. No, no, but no. That's, that's why, I mean, we use, you use these modes, you know, you, we are no more using volume control mode. We use rather assist control volume. That means the patient can initiate breath. Uh, and you know, get the breath. Uh, you, know, you you don't want you know, you 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 know that's the reason. I mean, you know, you yeah. know, like the smart modes really. I mean, they allow you to lessen the sedation because there is less vent dyssynchrony, and the ventilator kind of just itself. You know, it's very kind of very fancy. You know, it will give a little breath. You know, understand the lung mechanics, understand the airway resistance understand how active the patient is. So it just is fascinating to see like, you know, we will go, you know, initiate, give complete support, then start to win the support. And, you know, um, so uh, you, you, it allows you actually to lessen the sedation. Elias, are you on the line? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Just, while, just before yeah. I invite you to say something, I, it looks like uh, we have uh, Tigus Bacha who is, um, who is uh, in Israel and she is um, uh, a pediatric emergency medicine uh, specialist as well as a critical care specialist. And I'm not sure, Tigis, if you can unmute yourself um, and, um, and ask questions or, or provide comments. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Gurma. Uh, I miss you all. Uh, thank you, Zaid Dorsu. Um, just to add the point on the SIMV and AC, uh, we often use uh, SIMV because uh, because uh, if the patient is not sedated well and if the patient breathes over the ventilator, the AC will support every breeze and the patient will be at risk of pneumothorax. So because of that, uh, we use in pediatrics all the time SIMV. We don't encourage people to use AC. Even for adults, as far as the patient is sedated, AC and SIMV doesn't have a difference. So they can choose either AC or SIMV. But in pediatrics, because the respiratory rate can go like 60 normally, and uh, if the patient breathes over the ventilator seat breathes, uh, the child will develop uh, pneumothorax. That's why we encourage all of them. You know, our monitoring is not as meticulous as you do, so we, we prefer to use SIMB. The other is regarding sedation. Uh, I can say in our setting, uh, we barely over sedate patients. Uh, usually they don't get enough, enough sedation, so uh, I say um, do less sedation is almost don't do it's like don't do it because we don't give adequate uh, sedation or pain medicine. Thank you. 
Oh, well, that's, uh, that's uh, thank you. Good to hear your voice, and thank you. That's really a very important point, and, uh, and clearly there are a lot of theoretical aspects to this, but there is definitely a very objective and a practical aspect to um, to what is being done as well. And I'm I'm so happy that Tigris was on the line to clarify the SIMB issue. Uh, from uh, otherwise, there will be a lot of fighting that's going to happen between the machine and the patient, I think. Uh, so, uh, Elias, do you want to say, um, to add a few more things, and then we will um, conclude our session today. No, Gurma, thank you. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, like you said, I just want to remind uh, people to come up with their question next Friday for a panel discussion. Yeah. Sounds, sounds great. And uh, please uh, uh, continue to send your questions as we um, come next uh, Friday. Um, I also want everybody to know that uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you try to get your videos on and it's not working because the system is trying to really avoid video interference. And so when you come and join the sessions as much as possible, do not use video and mute yourself so that we can really have a good, clear um, uh, presentation so that we can also videotape and uh, put that on, online for everybody. And so when you come uh, online, please do not fight the system if your videos are not going uh, as much as you want them to be there. So with that, I really want to thank Dr. Zerihun today for an excellent presentation as usual and all the participants and we'll see you all on um, on friday so have a great day thank you thank you thank you uh